The North Shore is crushed by tourism. Visitors are returning to Hawaii at an unexpected pace, but at what cost? I'm not against tourism. I'm all for tourism. I'm just against unchecked, unregulated tourism. As the state's biggest industry, tourism is critical for our local economy. But is it destroying the social fabric of communities overrun with vacationers? As long as tourists come here with, with respect and open mind to how things are, I mean, learning our culture and everything. For years, there's been talk about managing tourism. There is such a thing as too much tourism. But there's also a thing called balance. So we're asking how much tourism is too much and who decides? This live broadcast and live stream of Kako, Hawaii's town hall, start now. Hello and welcome to Kako, Hawaii's town hall, live from the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Multimedia Station and Studio. I'm Ron Mizutani. You know, the clear Pacific Ocean, our pristine sandy beaches, and our famous Aloha Spirit lure millions to our shores every year. Did you know the Aloha Spirit is an existing law on the books in Hawaii. Take a look at this. From chapter five of the Hawaii Revised Statute, it reads, Aloha Spirit is the coordination of mind and heart within each person. It brings each person to self. Each person must think and emote good feelings to others. Is Aloha running thin for our visitors? Are some of us actually breaking state law? Well, in 2019, the state hit a new record when more than 10.4 million visitors traveled to Hawaii. That meant on average, there were nearly a quarter million tourists in Hawaii on any given day. And that number may have actually kept climbing, if not for the pandemic, which we all know crushed tourism. Now, the visitor shut down allowed island residents to have their beautiful state to themselves. It also gave nature time to heal and to thrive. Yet for our family and friends whose livelihoods depend on tourism, the effects of restrictions were devastating. And it's not over. Kako means all of us as in we're all in this together. So can we find a tourism strategy that is sustainable for locals and visitors? Tonight, we're talking with people who we think can make that happen. We wanna hear from you. You can email, you can call us, or even tweet your questions. We are also streaming live this evening at pbshawaii.org and on PBS Hawaii's Facebook page. Now tonight, our town hall group is appearing in studio and also via the internet. We have stakeholders from the travel and hospitality industries, along with community members in the trenches and our elected officials. We invited all four county mayors, but Kauai Mayor Derek Kawakami and Honolulu Mayor Rick Blanchiardi were not available this evening. All of our guests in studio are fully vaccinated and have the option of leaving their masks off. I wanna jump right into the event tonight. And I'm gonna start with you, Mahina. Mahina Paishan Duarte from the Aina Aloha Economic Future. Thanks for joining us. Mahalo for being with us tonight. You know, for, for years we've been talking about grassroots efforts and grassroots in our communities, and, and they need to be at the table. Are they at the table? Are your voices being heard? We don't think so. Um, certainly, I think we, we think that more efforts uh, are, are, are being had to welcome voices, but absolutely not. I think part of the reason why we formed as a group was when um, our state officials had called for an economic navigator, an economy navigator, uh, we, when we looked around the table, we didn't see the everyday working class person represented. Where were the teachers? Where were the, the nurses? Where were the, where were the regular hardworking folks? And so, you know, Aina Aloha really is calling for Julio or transformation. And this transformation is first grounded in a collective vision. You stated, you know, aloha, and, and part is, which is also part of our, our state model, mm -hmm. And so we believe that with a collective vision that's grounded in a, a, a deep and abiding love and a loyalty for our homeland, we can come together more collaboratively. But we certainly do not think that uh, community is um, welcomed. And so there's a lot of, we feel like there's a lot of mistrust um, uh, among big business and government. And I think there's an opportunity here Absolutely. to rebuild trust. I think that, and that's why we assembled this group tonight. Because I, I, I do believe what you're saying is very much possible. And, and shame on us if we don't make it happen. You have to have government buy-in. And I want to turn to you, Joe, Joe a guy joining, joining us from Hanalei Initiative. And really, it was, the impetus of the, your initiative was a storm of April 2018. It truly was a blessing in disguise. And the North Shore community was completely shut down. And as folks at home are seeing this video, 
it was provided an opportunity. Maybe you can share with us how that all came about. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Mahina. It was great to hear you share that. Um, I, I agree with you. Community is so important to be at the table, and when you have a community like ours that is, it, it's like many of the other communities, it's so special out in Hyena, and it's been really loved to death over the last few decades. So when the storm came in 2018, it went from you know, thousands and thousands of people down to none. And, and we really had an opportunity to kind of reset the environment and work together with, with community. Um, you're about to say something? No, but it, without community, you have community born, but you really need to government support to make yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, we're community guided, but I mean, community led, government supported is kind of our motto. And the community has to lead. And in Hyena, it's a, I don't know if anybody's been there, but there's a very vocal community. And the place is so special that if you, if you take care of the place first and really make that the priority and from the people of the place, I think you can find that the visitor, when they do come back in, it, it's actually a really, really great experience for them. I want to talk a little bit more deeper about uh, fees and how that's come to fruition out in Hanalei, and especially Hyena, and how it can be really mirrored. But in the meantime, I want to jump over to the Valley Isle and Napua Hueo of the Hana Highway uh, Regulation. And Napua, you're a lifer, if you will, uh, of that area. But you also have seen the transformation and incredible volume, especially when it comes to Hana Highway. Share your thoughts on how that's all come to fruition, but also how social media has really impacted uh, the islands and especially the volume that heads to, to your side of the island. <coughs> Hello, Herman. Thank you for having me. Um, in 2016, our organization was formed because we felt the uh, quantity of the visitor industry really bear down on us in East Maui. And the rise of the social media and the social media influencer has definitely been a detriment upon our community. We've actually had to form a web surveillance committee to monitor the channels online and do a lot of advocacy, helping influencers, um, convincing them to bring down uh, the content that shows visitors how to get to places that are located on private property. So I think it's very important that um, all of these organizations and businesses that bring social media influencers to Hawaii uh, make it a part of their policy to ensure that these influencers are not violating community policies uh, throughout the islands. Well said. Uh, thank you very much, Napua. Thanks for joining us. Cindy Punihaole, you're, you've been an advocate for this uh, effort for so very long. Uh, Kahalu'u Bay Education Center actually aimed to create this connection and this relationship with Hawaii County officials. You've found strategies in making folks more aware of education as, for, uh, di as opposed to enforcement. Uh, how, how did that all come to fruition for yourselves? I think it's so important that we look at our visitors uh, to, and this I'm talking about Kahalu Beach Park on Hawaii Island, but also on other, uh, other very important uh, locations in, um, on Hawaii Island. Visitors, uh, when they, they approach us uh, or visit our bay, I truly believe that our foundation and all of our uh, volunteers are Aloha ambassadors. That is the foundation to education and welcoming our visitors. And when I started this program back in 2006, I realized that if you were to approach someone in a loving way, they will embrace you and they will try their very best to help protect your bay. Unfortunately, Kahalu is a, a 4.2 acre park that received pre-COVID over 400,000 visitors a year. And that's a lot of visitors and they were loving the bay to death. So I am so fortunate and glad that Mayor Roth is in office now and we're able to talk with each other, talk with his uh, officials and look at some uh, projects that can be implemented now, not just talked about, but implemented that can help manage carrying capacity. And carrying capacity should be limited to environmental factors rather than financial incentives. Cindy, thank you very much. And I appreciate your comments on that. Mayor Roth joining us via Zoom as well. Mayor, your thoughts on the relationship that you folks have built uh, and, and how effective that can be in finding solutions? You know, uh, prior to being the mayor, I was a prosecutor and, and much of my career was a community oriented prosecutor and it meant 
building partnerships with communities to solve problems. In our first uh, 100 days, we've had a pledge to put on a sustainability summit. And uh, we, did we did do that. We had about 2,300 people join us for something like this online for two days, coming up with different ideas um, that really make a difference. Tourism was one of them. And uh, you know we're working on our DMAP plan, which is our destination uh, management action plan with the Hawaii Visitors, uh, uh, Hawaii Tourism Authority, as well as people in our community. And I think really getting the community involved is a huge part of solving these problems, coming to balance and figuring out how we move forward with tourism. Mayor, thank you. I kind of a, a transition right into you, John. John DeFries joining us, Hawaii Tourism Authority. John. It's about management plans, but it's also about execution. You got to get buy-in from community as well as uh, environmentals. Everybody else has to be on the same page. Don't you agree? I absolutely agree. And I think the, the important key word here is trust. Um, trust is the most important currency in uh, our ability to um, engage and learn from community. I think the destination management action plan uh, has provide a framework for each island where HTA was able to convene, create a safe space for a very diverse groups on each island to be able to debate and discuss uh, what the future of tourism would look like, should look like on each of their islands. And uh, you'll find those plans on our uh, website and I'd encourage you to look at it because there are actionable items and sub actions each of the each year for the next three years and uh, uh, the plans belong to each community and we're responsible for making sure that the implementation takes place and the resources are directed where they need to be. Thank you, John. I want to get back to our visitor officials on Zoom, but I want to turn to you, Keith Vera, because we're getting some we're getting a lot of questions already and folks, please continue to phone in your questions. Uh, question from Mike from Makiki. And if the governor is telling visitors not to come, how does he expect us to survive? And also, this is not going to continue forever. In fact, some people say that surge that we saw in the summer is pow. Yes, I mean, what people have forgotten is that for visitors in the uh, U.S. who are used to traveling to Canada, number two destination uh, that they traveled to was closed. Uh, Asia's closed. Parts of Mexico was closed. So Hawaii was viewed as safe, desirable. Everybody wants to come here. So we got an incredible rush in June and July. Well, we've already tapered off as Canada's reopened and people have to go back to work and school. So that has settled down. Um, the challenge with the governor's message is it's confusing. You know, either put restrictions on what you can do, put testing in, whatever it is, so that people understand the rules. If you tell people what they can do and cannot do, they'll follow. But if you give them uh, messages that are very hard to interpret, they may not come or you get the wrong visitors coming, which is the last thing we want. And, and a lot of folks have said that. We've seen a different visitor, if you will. And if we move forward together with some collaboration, we can we can find some strategies with that, including uh, fees that, that they're willing to pay. Uh, Mayor uh, Victorine, I want to turn to you. And, and we have to ask you the question, because when you look at Kahului Airport, Mayor, uh, that prompted you to say things that actually made national news, uh, to pause tourism. And, and maybe that was not the right uh, words, but that was the message at the time. Just your thoughts. Well, thank you, Ron, and everyone, good evening. First of all, that at that time, the airport was being taxed tremendously with pre-tests and post-arrival tests and all of this check-ins and, and, and systems that were in place. And our airport has not expanded for over 25 years. It is still the basic airport that Kahului. Not like Oahu, you just had a big expansion. First time, I think, in 20 or 25 years uh, that uh, I saw you, Peter, on the, on the news tonight. And, you know, it was wonderful to see that expansion, but we haven't. So we were being pressured and, you know, too many people were falling through the cracks. So the pause was really based upon these airlines that are offering very inexpensive bargain, bargain rate travel and, and, and other uh, incentives that were really hurting us. But I have seen the same thing as many as mentioned earlier. The big surge, the big pent up demand has fallen off. And with the, also the pandemic and the Delta variant moving very quickly, many people are now changing their plan or not coming at all. 
And so we're going to see a more leveling off, which will give us more time to work on our plans that we had originally initiated to get underway so that we can make a managed, very, very sustainable visitor industry. Mayor Victorino, thank you. Mufi Hanneman, I want to ask you the same question because we've seen uh, what Keith has talked about. Some people are already canceling, some people are already changing, and we haven't even seen our international travelers yet. And what's going to happen then? Well, I think it's all about striking a balance. And, and certainly, uh, we want to have uh, a situation whereby people can come to Hawaii. It is our number one industry. And I know there are those who are saying too many tourists and the like. But uh, I've also been uh, wearing a, a hat that has been in government. And, you know, a lot of economic diversification initiatives uh, have been bandied about through the years. It always tourism. So what we've seen, that surge, we're now hitting a, a shoulder seasoning, if you will, where tourism will slow down uh, and the numbers will bear that out. So as long as we know <clears throat> that that balance can be maintained uh, between having a safe and free and at the same time look to tourism to bring the tourists here with the airlines the hotels accommodating them and then working collaboratively across the board it can't be just one type of tourist that comes comes here and uh, we want to see uh, a responsible uh, tourism recovery we want to see tourists who are going to come here and respect the land respect us for what we are uh, and not take advantage of things so I really would like to see a balance, and that's where H, uh, LTA comes in. We're all about making sure that we will have this balance, put people, and then not take advantage uh, of the tourism situation. Thank you, Mufi. Uh, I want to turn to Peter Ingram from Hawaiian Airlines, the CEO and president, joining us tonight. Peter, uh, you have a tremendous responsibility. Uh, you are the vessel, if you will, that brings our visitors here and gives us economy, gives us revenue. It also, you're a very interesting player when it comes to working with community. You hear the mayor. You folks were working with him to find solutions. It starts there because you have to have the okoles to come in the seats to get to, to the islands. Your thoughts? I, I, I would echo the word that uh, Mufi used, which is balance. I, I think it, it is very important. And I heard the word balance earlier tonight from, uh, from the community leaders. And I, I think we, it's great to hear us speaking very much the same language. Uh, it is important that we think about the sustainability of this place, that we think about preserving the environment that is so precious, the ocean that is so precious. It's important that we think about sustaining the culture um, that's so precious. Uh, but it, it is also important that we sustain Hawaii economically. And we, we saw what happened last year when tourism was shut down very quickly and abruptly, we went from less than 5% unemployment to 35% unemployment virtually overnight. And it's not just the people working for companies like Hawaiian Airlines or the hotels. Um, the only thing that saved us from massive reductions in revenue to state government and county government was a federal bailout that was unprecedented in size and scale. So we, we've got to figure out how to make all of that work. And balance, I think, is uh, the key to, to figure out how we come up with good long-term solutions to solve all of those challenges. Balance, but also education. Uh, Kamahoe from, uh, on Instagram tonight, thank you, Kamahoe, asks, what if inbound flights here were mandated to screen films about responsible visiting? And we've heard that cry before. It seems like an easy fix. Your thoughts? Uh, it, it, it's, it's something we actually have messaging that we have on our airplanes. Um, we don't have screens on all of our airplanes. We have, uh, we have beamed um, some messages to people's iPads, so we, we can't compel them to look at it. But we have promoted and, and started this last year something that we refer to as Travel Pono, which we, where we're encouraging people to be aware of the expectations of the community that they're visiting and what it means um, to be a, uh, a good visitor. Uh, I don't know that we can get that message to every single person who gets on the airplane, but I, I think we're absolutely uh, willing to participate in carrying those messages forward. Thank you, I appreciate that. Sheila has asked tonight, how do you inform tourists to be respectful? 
People don't pack a bottle of respect pills when they travel. People are either raised to be respectful or they're not. Kurt Cushaw, I want to ask you that, uh, if, if you don't mind answering that, you see it in our parks, you've seen it in our trails in your old capacity, yeah. and we definitely have seen it uh, once that boom came back in the summer. You know, it's an interesting idea, and, and the, the term balance is, is critical, but coming at it from a, a government management standpoint, I'm a little jaded in that I've seen behavior essentially deteriorate over the years, and the different markets bring in different behaviors. I like the idea of messaging on the aircraft, but it's been my experience that you can message. We have signs at our state parks with a whole plethora of, you know, be respectful, here's, here's the interpreter information. A lot of people just do not pay attention. You know, they, they kind of check their, their morals, I think, sometimes at the, at the hotel, and they go out and, and they do what they, what they want to do. And it's an uphill battle because state parks, we are the, the, the best natural and cultural resources that are the attractors. And, you know, we're trying to, to work it from the standpoint of let's, let's reduce patronage and try to restore the balance between the recreational element and a lot of our, our natural environments, such as Kialikikua or Haena, are also really important cultural sites. And we've gone so far over the years of promoting recreation at the expense of the sanctity of the cultural sites. And I think this, this reboot that we have gives us a chance now to maybe try to find, again, that, that better balance between tourism and recreation and respect of host culture and natural resources, because they're all connected. Thank you. Very well said, uh, Kurt. And Kurt and I go way back. And boy, we've, we've had some good times together, and, and I appreciate you being here. Robert from Waikiki is asking, how do we increase the quality of tourism? Seems like to be the trend, uh, the theme tonight, instead of dealing with the numbers. And Wendy Laros joining us from uh, Kailua Kona and also from the, the Chamber of Commerce there. Wendy, thanks for joining us. How do you do that? I mean, even in, in, in a beautiful place like Kona or even Hilo or any parts of Hawaii Island, what's the solution to that? Is it, is it even possible? Even possible to do what? To f to increase the quality. Oh, of sorry. A okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, it's almost a defined. Yeah. It, it, everybody has that loosely defined. Oh yeah. Well, I think education, absolutely, and where that comes from, it can come from multiple different uh, venues. It can come on the airplane. It can come from the the hotel lodging, the servers at the restaurants. It can come from a, a lot of different places. Um, social media, certainly that is something that's very hard to manage. Uh, but I think it starts with the actual community. And I am a member of the I Hawaii Island Steering Committee for the Destination Management Action Plan. And we worked really hard on those plans. And they turned out really good. And the people that were involved, many, many different voices. And I think it really starts with seeing what your community wants, getting the community buy-in, and then educating actually your residents and those that interface with visitors because the visitors are learning from them. I want to turn to our service industry now. Uh, Keith, you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, Please. I just wanted to add that it, it comes from marketing, going after your target customer. Yeah. And that's why it was so concerning when HTA's budget, you know, the money was removed. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of people we don't need uh, marketing. We need more marketing than ever because we want the right visitor, someone who's going to spend, be respectful, be Italian. And you can find those people. Your partnerships with American Express cards or, or different kind of travel partners, the Hawaiian Air, will help you find those customers who are educated, who are somewhat sophisticated and respectful and want to come here and, and learn more of the culture and experience. So you have to do that, but you have to market. You cannot go like our legislatures are currently saying, we don't need marketing, we're so busy. That's just dumb. Thank you. I appreciate that. Tina Yamaki from the Retail Merchants, uh, you, your lens on this. Uh, as we talk about collaboration, we talk about strategies. In the meantime, there are folks that have not even gotten jobs back. Some jobs have not returned. Stores have closed. We'll talk to Greg in a bit about restaurants. What's the solution to those who are on the front line uh, in, our, in our merchants, our retail, and every place else? You know, for us, we're really um, looking for a lot of people to come in and apply for jobs. There are some job openings. Um, with retail right now, a lot of retailers are making 40% of what they did back in 2019. The money isn't there. People are not spending. Um, we have seen a different customer like everybody else has said here. We call them the McVisitors. Um, they come here on a budget. It's not our normal visitors. Um, they come in, they wreck our stores. You know, they 
don't even hang the clothes back up on the racks. Um, they're not spending the money. And we think we need to find the correct visitors, like Keith has said, that are going to spend the money, you know, so we can bring back more people to get more jobs and open it up more. But we also got to wait, too, because we understand that a lot of it is dependent on the international visitor. And like everybody knows, it's the story of the $20 bill where the visitor comes, you know, pays for the hotel room with the $20 bill, the hotel pays the front desk clerk, front desk clerk goes and buys a plate lunch, the plate lunch person goes and buys the vegetables, the vegetable person goes and pays the delivery guy to bring the vegetables to wherever it has to be. The delivery guy takes the $20 and buys shoes for his kids. So we're all intertwined some way with mm -hmm. it, and we need to find a great balance on getting more better visitors. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to get to you in a bit, but Greg Maples, maybe you can weigh in as well from the restaurant point of view, uh, how that's impacting you and what Tina had to say, as well as, you know, we're talking about local residents as well. I mean, we have to focus on our own Hawaii. A lot of folks can't even get uh, restaurant reservations, uh, and we really haven't even seen our international visitors yet. Yeah, I, I, thanks for having us here. I, I, it, the restaurant industry was devastated, as everybody knows, during the, the heat of the pandemic. And we learned very much uh, as a restaurant industry how much we relied on, on tourism, especially those that were maybe off into uh, rural areas. And, you know, we saw, you know, 30, 40 percent of the restaurants close. And we, we anticipate those restaurants continuing to close. Remember, these these are folks that only two thirds, uh, I'm sorry, only one third of the of all the restaurants in all of Hawaii received any kind of money in PPP or idle or anything. Two thirds received nothing. And so there's still mounds of debt, mounds of rent that needs to be paid. And we have a staffing shortage. We have capacity issues and we have supply chain problems. And those are all things that we're dealing with. Um, and we did see a surge in with the tourism and we did see restaurants, you know, they were packed, you couldn't get a reservation, but it, it was all because of those three things, capacity, because of supply chain issues and be, um, because of our uh, the staffing and capacity. So going forward, we know that we're, we're reliant on tourism and we, and the other thing I just want to back up and say, so many of our restaurants in the culinary world rely on local um, farms and ranches for their food. And so, as Tina said, when, when tourism goes down or is, infe is affected in any way, it just backs right up the supply chain, right back up the supply chain. Peter Ingram, do you have some thoughts you wanted to share? Yeah, I'd like to just caution a little bit about reading too much into the demographics of the visitor of the summer 2021. As people have said, we don't have the international visitors back. The international visitors will come back. That will change our demographics. If you looked at who was booking travel earlier this year, and this started to change as we got towards the summer, it was a lot of younger people and fewer older people before the vaccines became widely available. The 60 year old, 50 year olds were more hesitant to travel than people in their 20s and 30s. That started to normalize again. Uh, as Keith talked about earlier, we had differences in the destinations that were available for people traveling from the US mainland. So I, I think trying to extrapolate from the summer of 2021 is a dangerous game because it is an unusual year and frankly one I hope none of us have to go through again. Absolutely. But, you know, in the meantime, and I do I respect what you say, Peter, but in the meantime, I want to turn to Kathleen Pahinui, uh, because no matter what kind of visitor is arriving, we see traffic on the North Shore that is unprecedented. And, and you know, the solutions is, is, I don't even know what the solution is, especially at Lanakea Beach, when you see everybody's out there to see a turtle. Um, and some of them could be in our international visitors as well. How do, how do you find that balance? Um, not sure. Uh, I want to uh, shout out to John at HTA. We met with him earlier this week, and he's going to be coming to our neighborhood board in November to talk about their DMAP for Oahu and how we on the North Shore can be a part of that and, and that execution. Um, it's been horrendous for us on the North Shore. It, it was really bad. And a big shout out to Joel and and Napua for the work you guys done. We're looking to you as models of, of how to make things better for our community on the North Shore. It, it was just, Laniakea is the worst. 
probably the biggest bottleneck. And we have some really bad issues with government. Not We don't feel supported by government in that issue. Uh, Noah and sorry, Kurt, don't mean to th throw DLNR under the bus, but we're not feeling supported very much by either organization right now. And I feel for Kurt. I know what it's like to have people trespass and not not be respectful. And, and I, we did see the visitor this year was not respectful. And Napoy, you are so right about social media. The guidebook started it years ago and social media just took it to that next level. So hopefully our work with HTA will help undo some of that craziness. But um, Napua and Joel will be reaching out to you guys as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And, and like I said, Joel, that, that is something that people can mirror uh, and have some success at. You folks have shown that. Eric Gill, I'm looking at you and I know you're at the edge of your seat uh, because at the end of the day, we have seen jobs disappear at our hotels and never to be returned. Uh, and again, how do you fight for your folks who are trying to make a living, a decent living, uh, without losing their jobs? And, and again, international visitors haven't even come back yet. We're asking our, our staff to do different things, even asking a housekeeper or having to ask for a housekeeper to clean your room. I mean, where has the aloha gone? Yeah, the aloha has left home. Look, when we talk about balance, we should be talking about the economic balance that exists. And the truth is, people judge tourism by the perception of the benefit versus the impact on us. And obviously the impact on our communities has been severe. And, and the truth is the benefits of tourism are, have become more and more scarce. Since, since uh, between uh, the 20, last 20 years leading up to 2019, uh, the visitor arrivals increased by 52% and the tourism employment increased only by 10%. So what we've seen is an increasing disparity between the number of tourists and the benefit that is uh, generated to Hawaii. Uh, it was just pointed out, right? People got to make, the front desk clerk got to get some of that 20 bucks or it doesn't go to the grocery store or any other place. The fact of the matter is tourism has brought in more and more tourists and fewer and fewer jobs and that trend has gotten a lot, lot worse in 2021. We've seen uh, major corporate uh, hotel employers, owners and operators, eliminating daily room cleaning, uh, basically reducing the value of the, uh, the package that tourism is buying and, uh, and, and making it, you know, why would I pay for a hotel room if I, if I gotta clean my own room? Why don't I go to a vacation rental? And many, many people are doing that. What we're seeing is still a high number of tourists and yet hotel occupancy is dropping off precipitously. The leaders of our industry are not acting responsibly to the people of Hawaii. If we're going to have tourism, we have to have the jobs that make it worthwhile for us. It is absolutely imp improper for, for the tourist bosses to, to eliminate jobs and eliminate services just wholesale and they are doing it and they're making it permanent. Hilton came out and told their investors a year ago, we're gonna eliminate data room service, we're gonna eliminate this, we're gonna eliminate that, and we're gonna lock these in in the long term to, pre, you know, to get uh, benefits for our investors. It's no surprise. We've been talking about it for a year. It's playing out in front of our eyes. Thousands of people haven't been brought back. And the difference between uh, daily housekeeping and non-daily housekeeping is about 20% of the workforce. You know, this is all screaming to diversity. Uh, and, and Carl Bonham, I want to turn to you now. This is something that we've been talking about for, I guess, my lifetime, if you will. Is it even possible? I mean, consider the millions and millions of dollars in revenue generated by the visitor industry. How do we diversify? Do we have an opportunity right now uh, even in the midst of, of COVID? Well, mahalo for, uh, for that tough question. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about di diversifying the economy, not we, uh, but people in Hawaii for longer, much longer than you and I have been alive. Uh, it, it goes, you know, all the way back to when we, the discussion was about diversifying away from, from big ag, from sugar and, and, and pineapple. Uh, and tourism was the solution at the time. Uh, and so, you know, the one the one thing that you really have to recognize is diversification is something that takes an extremely long period of time. It's, you know, there are no magic wands. You can't flip a light switch and suddenly diversify away from an industry as important and as large as tourism is. Um, if I, you know, if I can, I, I wonder if I could come back to the to the title of the show. Yes, please. Um, yes, please. 
how much tourism is too much and and who decides and i think you know there've been there's been a lot of discussion tonight about balance and about community and you know those those are incredibly important and and they're not things that we've had uh historically right the the community hasn't been at the table in in much of the decision making um and you know how much is too many i think that's really not the right question i think the right question is uh how do we manage the negative implications the negative side effects that come with any number of tourists because you know any time you add more people to our hiking trails or to our beaches there will be impacts and you know if you go all the way back to to 1988 when when uh, we had the first resident satisfaction surveys uh, 40% of the residents were felt like tourism was really not uh, better for them than alternatives right and so even back in 1988 when we had around 6 million visitors there were people who you know community members who felt like they really weren't being being served and so what's missing is an overarching uh not just a plan but an execution right so yeah. um yeah. and i i was just like to throw out a cliche uh you manage what you measure and you know i think it it would be a uh, as part of these these uh ma management plans that we've been talking about i know we're we're talking about specific locations we've heard a lot of stories tonight we should be measuring though the negative impacts at every one of these locations where we have hot spots mm -hmm. and tracking it right whether it's kahulu bay how many people are in kahulu bay right now kahulu bay excuse me and and track that over time if you don't measure it and track it you can't see whether you're making any progress but so we, we have tracked it well we've that, tracked I understand it for that. years but, but we haven't tracked it we haven't tracked all of the impacts right i'm i'm talking about everything right i have water quality testing no, no i, but I, I mean but, all, but across I the think whole state all the state i agree yeah. but at kahalu i think you know what you're talking about is very important when when we look at how can we balance this biodiversity with economic recovery, we need to find and implement programs that are realistic on the ground today, not 10 years from now or two years from now. One of the things that we're looking at right now, working with National Park Service, uh, DAR and also uh, OCCL, is a snorkel trail where visitors can actually be guided into an area so that they can have a rewarding experience at the end of the snorkel trail but not trampling all over the bay <laughs> we need to create these pro we need to implement these programs. we've talked about these programs for for years and last year we had them all in place when you talk about hot spots those those plans should have been in place before we opened up on October 15th. Cindy, of last I, year. I, I think people will agree with you because some people say we missed the opportunity. Others say we capitalized on it. We made the most of it. Councilmember King, I want to invite you to this one too, is because you talk about diversification as well. And it was the impetus of what you introduced as well, which was eventually vetoed by the mayor. But your goal was to build homes for residents, it was for, to diversify our economy and not so much focus on the hotels. Correct me if I'm right or right. No, you're right, but um, you know, I want to agree with Peter that we're conflating a lot of what's happening with tourism uh, with COVID. Right. There's a lot of unusual things happening right now that aren't normal, but this issue of over-tourism started back in, it started becoming vocal on Maui back in 2018, 2019. So it's not a new issue that happened because of COVID. COVID made us realize what we could have if we, if we got back to normal numbers. And, and so, you know, we haven't been working on diversifying the economy for a long time. I started talking about it when I got on the council in 2017, and I didn't get much support for it back then. So, you know, I'm seeing a lot of opportunity, especially with groups like Aina Aloha Futures. And these are the things that we need to implement right now so that we're not so dependent on tourism. But, but the other thing I wanted to say, uh, Ron, is that there's a big difference between what the people want and what the tourism industry and government is doing. And the, the thing that we're not going to get solutions unless we agree on what the goals are. Mm -hmm. Because everywhere I turn, people want less tourists on the island. Yes. Reduce the numbers. 
And what I hear when I talk to the, the tourism people is like, well, we're never going to be able to reduce tourists, so we just have to figure out how to manage them once they get here. But I, I think we have to come to an agreement that, that, that those numbers are high. They're, they're higher. They, they actually violate our Maui Island plan because right. we have a prescription in there for um, the, the percentage of tourists to uh, residents. And we were over that back in 2019. So and we need to come to that agreement, first of all, that, that that's what we're looking for is reasonable numbers of tourists. You know, I would, that's why I, I proposed a moratorium. That was, would be a boon to the hotels because let's not build more hotels if we can't fill up the ones that we already have, right? And, and that's part of that balance that we're all looking for is let's look at what, what numbers do we want here. And I believe if you're asking who decides, I think it's the people who decide. Indeed. You know, we have, to, we have to support the people on the island and we have to give them that opportunity to be at the table. And not only at the table, but have a voice. Mahina, uh, Julie from Kailua a asks this question, and I think you're, you might be the perfect person to answer it. Address the quality of life for the local people. All we're hearing tonight is about business. Yeah, well, you know, tourism has profited from the beauty of our beaches, the, you know, the, the perfect balmy weather, and uh, the, the grace of our culture, right? And so we, you opened up this tonight's discussion with, with aloha and what that is. I would like to um, offer up Let's transition from being known, known, known as a state of aloha to a state of kuleana. Because we forget part of the, the aloha, the definition of aloha, it's reciprocal, right? It's a mutual transaction. It's a mutual exchange. So that's what we're not seeing here. You know, uh, we need to rebrand ourselves and we need to rebrand around a commitment to caring for our homeland first, for the, the aina that continues to nourish us and, and, and to care for one another. Again, you know, some of our peers here have spoken eloquently um, about how community has come together in times of, of despair and adversity. And we need community to be a part of decision making um, because not one sector, not one industry, not even one community group have, have all the solutions. So we need to come together, I agree with you, around a common vision and a set of values that's gonna drive us and propel us to a better future than, than what we see now. I think this is an opportunity. Joel, I want to go to you because you folks have implemented this. You folks have seen that, say, yeah. so for example, fees, yeah. people are willing to pay that. Absolutely. I just, I mean, there's so much I want to jump in on throughout yeah. tonight. So what a great conversation. And, and I, I just want to caution, like, I understand the mayor's desire to have everybody on board, but, but they're not all going to be on board. And then that has to be okay, right? We have to look like, don't let... What is it? Perfect be the enemy of good. Like, like, don't not do it. And I know uh, the big island was talking about like, hey, we're, we're tired. We got to do it already. And I think that's so important that we start to implement those things because I, I would, you know, it's like we want the right visitor. But we found that in 2019, we we operated a shuttle into this park, and we sold out a couple what 280 seats a day at $15 a person. And we reopened in July of this year, and the price more than doubled. And we could have sold thousands of seats like nobody even blinked an eye at that price point which I, I we were talking earlier about how that may not be able to be sustainable but it was interesting to see that like you and and the value of having those people um you know kind of uh put through a shuttle system we moved about seventy thousand people in 2019 when we opened and that's a great opportunity to, to give messaging like everybody's stuck on a shuttle for 20 minutes we were able to have scholars within our community write the messaging for on board and that was able to play and, and these are like local kids from our area that wrote amazing, you know, stories about these areas all the way out to Hyena. And so everybody had to listen to that. It wasn't about selling cheeseburgers or anything else. It was about the place and people had to really feel that. And, and to speak to uh, Napua's point earlier, and I don't want to just, I want to give somebody else a chance to talk, but, you know, having those, the capacity of our shuttles because of the bridge capacity at eight tons, you can only have 25 passenger vehicles. So that really layers in the amount of people that hit the area at a time, right? You don't have... 900 people trying to hit K at 9 o'clock in the morning when they all want to go. You say, you got to go at 7, you go at 7.30, 8, 9, all the way till 11.30. So you really space out the impact to the area, and it really does a nice job of creating that balance. Yeah, no, and I've seen it work. I've seen it work, and it can work uh, with the proper education, proper buying, proper support. Uh, Mayor Victorino, I want to ask you, because I know this is something dear to you as well. You, you talk about Maui being a destination uh, but you, t but first and foremost, it's a community, and, and that you've said that before. Community first, vacation destination second. 
How do you strike that balance? Thank you for that question. It's not an easy balance to strike. And I guess all of us, and what we are trying to emulate, what Hyena has been doing, because at Wainapa Napa, we've done a reservation system that has turned out to be very self-sustaining. And we're looking at other areas in East Maui, South Maui, West Maui, where we can do the same. But balancing the visitor with our, our, our resident, you know, making sure that our parks are available for our residents, that parking is there for them. Also, another model that I like using is uh, Hanama Bay. Being able, and right now we're working on our plan, along with the state plan, to start closing some of our parks weekly so that we can rejuvenate and renovate and maintain the quality and not have it trampled every day, day in and day out. You know, these are very important where the residents now will also have free parking and our visitors, like that gentleman is saying, they'll pay for it. Okay, let them pay for it. I think that's fine with me. Let our residents be the benefactors of making sure that they're always number one. And that's the balance that's sometimes very hard to strike overall, but I, we're working and with, you know, sometimes I know the council and I don't always agree on everything, but I tell you what, we do agree. We're here for our community and we're gonna do the best we can for them. Amen to that, uh, Mayor Victor. Not everybody will agree and, and that's okay. And that's totally okay. Rick from Oahu asks, how are Airbnbs affecting tourism? How can they be better managers? And also, when we talk about illegal, illegal vacation rentals, the impact they're having on communities. And uh, I'm gonna leave that to Keith Vieira. Can you answer that? Yeah, I, I think it's really important that you understand the numbers. Yeah. Uh, 2009, 43,000 hotel rooms, six and a half million visitors. 2019, 43,000 hotel rooms, no change, 10 million visitors. Basically, three and a half million visitors went to accommodations, alternative accommodations, most of them illegal. I mean, I fully agree with, with uh, Eric, and we don't usually agree, um, that we've got to do things <laughs> that create employment um, and create taxes and drive revenues into the community. And while there's nothing wrong with people who want to stay in a house and enjoy, I mean, that, that's wonderful. We all probably do it. But our community should be consulted if that's what they want. They should be legal. They should be paying the same taxes that hotels pay. But if you look at, and what do these people do when they're here? They go to Costco and they go hiking, biking, and they're in the resources and they're loving it. It's, I understand that, but that's not the visitor we want to target for growth. We're always going to have some. I think there what, are 1,700 legal units, and uh, just in July, there were 22,000 illegal units. Right. Uh, that if we get a hold of that and manage that process, then we will be able to control the use of all of our uh, resources. Because the issue is not how many people arrive. If you have five, uh, Japanese stay five nights, if they arrive and they were all the visitors, we'd be empty. If they were Canadians, they say three weeks, we would be over full and the bars would be full. Um, so <laughs> we've got to do things. <laughs> we, we've got to do things to attract that right visitor. And while there's nothing wrong with Airbnb and the service they provide, the fact that these illegal accommodations are not paying their taxes and driving visitors that we aren't looking for, that's the challenge we face. My friend uh, Caesar would say, what are you talking about? Uh, but I no, you're true. That wrong from, from um, the Hawaii State Association of Counties who's looking at this as a, a part of our legislative package. We need uh, authority from the state legislature. The councils need authority to regulate the hosting platforms. Absolutely. And that's a huge part of it. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our, um, our administration and Department of Planning because our Department of Planning has done a really good job of enforcing against illegals. We put money in, we hired a consultant, and they've dropped that list from the thousands down to they tell us uh, it's between one, 150 and 200 illegals. So I don't think that's the bulk of the problem on Maui. I think it's just too many arrivals. Well, yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. 20,000 of those illegal vacation rentals are right here on Oahu. Yeah, uh, that's on your right. And I know that uh, Mayor Blanchard and his team are working on that. I wish he was here to answer that yeah. question. In the meantime, though, Ron I want to turn could, to... Who's, who's asking Ron, me? Ron, could I just say yes, really please, quickly Catherine. on that, I do want to say a shout out to Mayor Blanchard and Adina Chida at DPP. They've come up with an excellent bill. And the other thing I want to say is, uh, Mufi, the hotels need to do a better story a job telling their story. They, people like to say all the money goes out of the island and that's not true. It goes back to what Eric said earlier, that $20. So much of the money the hotels bring in 
goes back into our economy and goes to our people. So I hope you guys can really tighten up that story. Thank you. Mufi, I'm going to allow you to, to address that as well, because I know that this a lot of those illegal vacation rentals are smack dab in the middle of our communities. And they're really, uh, you know, using our resources, certainly spending money. But what, what is your answer and your thoughts on how this is being approached in all the counties, especially here in Oahu? I think we have a wonderful opportunity now uh, to seize control uh, and, and, and change uh, the whole aspect of vacation rentals that are illegal. Uh, and certainly is trying to do it we want to support that because i've always said this if your vacation rentals compete with us okay you shouldn't be uh in uh the areas of our, our residential neighborhoods because you drive up uh the uh, cost of uh, affordable housing so i think all the counties uh, they say well you we want to wait to the state i think the counties can do it the counties can do it right now and let's 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 set the bar uh, whereby if you're going to be in the in the resort areas then you're going to pay the taxes pay the tat you're going to pay the real property taxes and the like and you should not be existing in residential neighborhoods especially if you're illegal uh you're going to compound the problem of affordable housing so when you talk about uh getting our story out uh our story is this our story is that you in resort areas, then it should be legal. Uh, and so I really want to implore all the counties. Honolulu now has a chance uh, with the with the initiative that's coming out uh, from uh, the administration that to me makes a lot of sense because that's what I've said for years that you shouldn't be in residential areas if you're not legal. Now let me also touch upon Hanama Bay. The Hanama Bay model that I've talked about is I was the guy that was on the council, worked with the council then to set up that model. Problem charging fees, but let's make sure that those fees go back to that particular attraction. Yes. To that yeah. particular view. Yes. Or what yes. have do not throw it and do not tempt government by putting in the general, general fund, fund way back. Because that is what has been lacking in the past. So um, these are the two areas that we at HLT are very, very uh, concerned about, and we want to be able uh, to do more with. And that is a Bay model. Uh, and we want, you know, let's not hear about these things that, well, you know, uh, there's other places on Oahu that should be looking what we've done at Hanama Bay. Manawili Falls, Manoa Falls, Cocoa Head, Kaina Pointra. All these things are, I think, will create the balance that I talked about earlier. And then secondly, uh, on that vacation rental stuff, this is the time. Uh, because as Keith pointed out, we haven't really uh, the hotel in, in, in between. The hotel rooms have remained the same. And I'm sorry, Kelly, but I don't think moratoriums are going to do it. Okay. Uh, we, we really need to look at ways uh, in which we can have, um, you know, uh, that are legal uh, and, 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 you know, once again, uh, be able to create the balance that, that, that I've talked about. Thank you, Mufi. I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I, have to, I have to say something. Please, Eric, by all means. And then I want, we, I want to jump I, to a different Keith topic. is right, yes, uh, and Mufi's right. We, we actually have worked together with management. We put a lot of effort and time into getting uh, restrictions on vacation rentals, and we were able finally to pass something through the city council. The enforcement it hasn't been sufficient to make use of that. But we first have to address a more fundamental question. Why would people choose to go there? And the fact is, if you go to a hotel and you get your room clean and you can get a meal on property and you have uh, resort amenities, that's a reason for people to stay in a hotel. If you take away the room cleaning, you close the restaurants, you take away the valet service, what advantage is there to go to a hotel versus a, a, a vacation rental? The industry has to rein itself in at this point. They have, to, they have to make a commitment to good service for our guests, or we'll never get the quality of guests we're looking for. We're never gonna have the jobs that, that, that justify whatever impact there is. The industry has to take a change now and, and, and sure. abandon this it's whole coming. thing of abandoning services. Yeah. It's I, coming, I the I, pandemic will end, it's coming. You're right, it's gonna come back. Hilton has already said it's permanent. No, well, I, 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 I think- no, this is this is it's clear. Just hearing from everybody, 
that the opportunity is now. And I want to go to Faith, uh, who asked this question tonight, and I really appreciate all the calls that we're getting. And Tina, I'm going to ask you to think about this question, because I do think it impacts all that's being said. And I want to hear from what the retailers are thinking about uh, with illegal vacation rentals, how they impact you folks, as well as everything else that's being said tonight. First, it would be ideal if counties would recognize those who have put in the steward sweat equity uh, and honor the funding meant for these efforts instead of having posers and promoters impede on the funds and do the same old, same old. In other words, right back into what exactly everybody's saying, right back into community. And for the retail side, how does that impact you? You know, for illegal vacation or any type of vacation rentals, I mean, they come into our stores and they and they buy things. Personally, I don't believe it's right. I mean, they need to play on a fair game. If the legal rentals are paying taxes, the illegal ones should be too. They should be registered. I mean, they're the ones also, you know, we're always hearing from our, our workers, I can't afford to rent a house here. It's too expensive here in Hawaii. And we've seen that a lot of the rentals have been put into the um, illegal vacation rental pool because those owners think that they can make more money off of it. What we're also seeing is I think we talked about influencers too. Some of these illegal rentals are a lot cheaper to stay in than a hotel and a bunch of them will come over. What we found out too is a lot of these in influencers were coming to Hawaii, especially in the beginning, the younger crowd like Peter had mentioned, and they were asking everything for free. I'm an influencer, so you have to give me this clothes for free. I'm an influencer. You have to give me this ice cream or food for free. I'm going to take a picture, put it up, and everyone's going to come on. Nobody knows who these influencers are. And don't get me wrong, there are some legitimate ones out there who are truly trying to help us. But there was a lot of them that were just trying to have a free vacation here. Too. And that, that's the sad part about it, is when we're seeing retailers and everybody else taking advantage of it. It's not right. Greg Maples, if you don't mind sharing your thoughts from the restaurant's perspective uh, on how this impacts you. And, you know, some would say, well, how, why would it impact the restaurants? Don't, don't they get the business from, from the visitor, whether they're staying in an illegal vacation rental? And don't forget about our local community that wants to have supper as well, not to mention all the COVID restrictions that are in place now. But how, how is the restaurant industry looking post-COVID? Because there will be a post-COVID. How is it looking now, post-COVID? Uh, as you look forward, because I think we need to all look forward beyond you know what, what we're seeing now, what's happening with the restaurant industry when it comes to the, all this talk about illegal vacation rentals and the impact it's having within our communities. Well, look, first, the first place that it impacts restaurants the most is that our poor people have to have two jobs to be able to afford any place to live. And because we're we, a lot of our folks are are at the $15 and above uh, level, it, it takes two full time jobs for some of our folks to be able to afford things. So that's the first place. So we're wearing we're wearing our own local people out just to be able to afford or they're living multi generational in homes. And what's happened is because that's happening, we've lost a lot of our youth, a lot of our incredible talent and workers have gone to the mainland to go get jobs that not only pay better, but the, the cost of living is lower. And so as we reel this in, we're gonna, we're gonna make life better for everybody. Now, whether somebody stays in a hotel or, a, or an Airbnb, there, there's certainly, if you're in an Airbnb and you're a family, you're gonna cook at home more than if you were in a hotel. And we would love for them to be in a hotel where they do, where meals are part of it. You know, the, the, Hawaii, the Hawaii has such a rich culture in food and it's a part of the fabric of who we are. And we need to, and we wanna tell that story. So many great culinary experts are on our islands and can tell that story and are telling that story. But you know, the, the fact that we have illegal um, rentals anywhere, it's just a slap in the face to everybody who lives here. And it's just deplorable. Now I'm not saying that the guests who come here know that they're staying in those places, but the people who, who own those, you bet you better believe they know. And it's killing our people. It's just killing our people. Greg, uh, thank you for that. There's a question. That um, yes. in the regards to the illegal operators, there's a whole industry of illegal tour operators. Hana Highway Regulation was actually formed mm. because of all of our legal tour providers being put at a significant disadvantage 
um, by the illegal tour operators, which is an issue uh, at the PUC and their lack of enforcement agents and their ability to come into island and to be able to ticket these illegal operators. But um, aside from the illegal accommodations, there's a huge issue with illegal operators um, in the entire industry. I think we're seeing that statewide, Napua. You know, everyone, uh, this is uh, Land, Ladlin from Kauai asks, uh, and John DeFries, I want you to give some thought to this question. Everyone on this show is talking about tourism as the only viable economic driver. While we're losing our keiki to high paying tech jobs and they're moving out of state. As the leader of the HTA, how do you address that? And Carl Bonham, I want you to follow up as well. Uh, we are losing some of our most talented keiki uh, to different industries. There is an opportunity to diversify, yet a lot of the focus is on the visitor industry. It's the topic of tonight's show. But John, just your thoughts. Sure. Uh, you know, Ron, I think we need to start looking at tourism as a driver of diversification, as opposed to the antithesis of it. Um, and case in point, you know, you go back 30 years when uh, the culinary chefs uh, in our industry made a commitment to put Hawaii on the culinary map globally and, um, and commit to a regional cuisine program. The minute they did that, right, Sam, Roy, Alan, you go right down the list, Peter, Merriman, the minute they did that throughout the state, they altered cottage farming on each island. All of a sudden now, my tomatoes have to meet a certain quality standard and I needed to meet the market demand, right? So it altered um, that aspect, that industry. It altered the way beef producers on each island looked at the opportunity in those restaurants as well. And then as well as the local fishermen. So it is one example of how tourism, uh, which in itself is a composite of diverse skills and diverse industries. And so I, I just think we need to do a better job at doing that. And, and IT and tech jobs are, are all part of that makeup uh, of our industry. John, thank hey, you. Ron. Carl, I see you Ron. nodding your head. Yeah, please. So yeah, actually, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah Ron, real yeah, quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, Maui, we are trying to now move with not only agriculture as a sustainable industry. Uh, we're looking at high tech. We've seen what's happening on the Nai'i. I think you've seen that with, uh, um, what's his name, uh, uh, Choi, Chef Choi and that. We also committed to many of our restaurants and uh, uh, major chefs like Ram Iran, uh, Roy Yamaguchi and all of those to produce crops to meet their standards. But one of the important things is when this pandemic started, many of our farmers wanted to plow under their fields like what's happening in the mainland. And we immediately turned with the help of the council put monies and bought up all these crops to feed many of the unemployed hotel workers and other industries uh, who had been laid off. And that was with this promise from all of the farmers that when this pandemic was over and the tourists come back or the visitors come back, they will always remember to keep selling and providing to our farmers markets and to our local residents. And many of them have followed through on that. And finally, wellness. That's another area that I think here in Maui, we're moving. We have a lot of kapuna that not only are born and raised here, but are moving here. And we have the tsunami of, of gray that is coming and we need, and we are looking at how we can provide many money services for that particular group, because I have become a kapuna like many others in that, out there <laughs> in that, in, on your show. And we need to continue to move in that direction because that's sustainable, but that's wellness. Wellness that can, can promote good, healthy lifestyle for people and this obesity and diabetes and all these other problems can be kind of weighed down and changed and made a better place like the ancient Hawaiians did. We were all healthy people. Let's continue to move in that direction. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Carl Bonham, uh, we're, the brain drain, we t we've been hearing about that for many, many years. It also contributes uh, with the visit industry struggles as well. Can it be stopped? And, and how do you keep the talent home and really address the question about that? And, and can the visitor industry be a part of that conversation? So let me first uh, start with with following up on uh, John's comments, which were just right on the money uh, about thinking about uh, diversifying Hawaii's economy by looking at areas of strength that are really part of tourism, right? Whether it's restaurants, farming, uh, culinary, film, um, all of these things are things that 
that you know are in some way related to tourism and we already do them well, very very well uh, resort management uh, architecture uh, building of resorts things that we can export to the rest of the world that you know we're really really good at because we first did it here in hawaii and one of the things that that is you know it's really tech is everybody wants to be a silicon something right and uh, part of the problem with that is that uh, the reason the Silicon Valley exists is be it's basically a magnet. It's a draw, right? Businesses want to be there because there's so many innovators there already. And we have a problem of scale. We have a problem of distance. And so we really have to look at what we already do really well and figure out how to expand on that rather than trying to do something completely new and focus on things where you know you really have to be in Hawaii to do it whether it's because of our location in the middle of the Pacific or it's because we can do research and development around around energy for example around clean energy there there's certain things that you you pretty much have to be here in order to do them and and those are the areas to focus on uh, rather than just more broadly on tech and then finally on the brain drain thing um, you know it's uh, it's really a matter of job opportunities and, and cost of living and people make choices about where to live based on all kinds of factors from, you know, cost of living, job availability, close to family. Uh, and, you know, the fact of the matter is many of, many of our keiki end up relocating and, and, you know, maybe going away to college and not coming back because they can't find the job that they're looking for. And for some of them, those jobs will, will never be available. Uh, for, for others, as the economy does diversify, uh, th those opportunities will exist. And we're seeing, you know, there's some really interesting programs going on right now from uh, like the Movers and Shakas that I think could be, uh, could be beneficial in helping to bring some, some Kamina home. Thank you, Carl. Wendy, I want to turn Ron, to you. Ron, Ron, let uh, me add one, one thing to Okay, John. I, I think that the, <laughs> the, one of the, the uh, areas that, to build on what Carl just said, you, you, we've got to place some emphasis on um, native intelligence, indigenous wisdom, yeah. merging with uh, modern science and technology. You look at the work going on in Kahlug um, uh, Bay in Kona, this is bringing together uh, the wisdom of our ancestors together with the best of modern science. And, and Hawaii will become the pico, really the, 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 the place on earth where this level of integration between what is modern knowledge and what is ancestral uh, will go on to define the, the Hawaii brand going forward. I love as that. As a community. Yeah, I love yes. that, John. Wendy, I want to turn to you because it, when, it, when I look at uh, a community that can diversify and has an ag and, and tech in different industries, uh, I think of Kailua Kona and, and for yourself as well, how do you get those businesses to continue to develop that? And really, it's a, it's a part of diversifying our economy, which addresses the visitor industry questions as well. Well, we have the Natural Energy Lab of Hawaii Authority. And so that's on the point of Keaholi. And there's pipes that go down really, really deep, thousands of feet deep, and they bring up cold seawater that gets pumped to businesses. And it's called the Ocean, it's the um, Hawaii Ocean Science and Technology Park. It's rebranded to that now, but it's businesses that use that cold water. So abalone, shrimp, octopus, those, those kinds of, and so there's all kinds of, of innovation that's going on right there, right on the Kona coast and the state you know, invests in that. Uh, there's also astronomy and we have astronomy on top of Mauna Kea and that is also something that came about to diversify the economy you know, 50, 50 plus, 60 years ago. And so there are some things on Hawaii Island that we have that are unique. We were talking about what's unique um, and with the the top of the mountain, that's also a visitor attraction. Sure. So it also ties into tourism as well. Mayor Roth, I want to turn to you. Uh, I see you shaking your head in affirmation uh, because there's a lot of positive things happening within community, within a collaboration of businesses, but also most importantly, I think tonight, it was within our, our deep in our community voices. And, and again, the, the whole theme of this evening is 
who needs to be at the table, who decides uh, that question? And I, I really think it's everybody. And uh, get, going back to the last question, you know, the way you make these things happen, the way you diversify, the way you get technology and tourism and all of these things working together is you have to have that intent. You have to be intentional about what you're doing. You know, one of the things that is happening on the Big Island is that we have a lot of really amazing people, amazing um, businesses, uh, amazing things that go into uh, sustainability. We have also some of the biggest um, corporation um, executives here. And what we found is the way you make this work is you start inviting these people and you start connecting these people to each other and to the community. And you start these conversations like we're having tonight, but you focus on, on different areas. And by doing that, you're able to, to make things happen, to keep our keiki here, to allow them to raise their keiki on, on this island or in this state. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a victim of that. All three of my children now are living off, off, uh, off island, out, out of state actually. And so we have to be intentional and we have to not exclude, but include people. I feel you, Mayor. I, two of my three are as well uh, living off island. Kurt, I want to turn to you because a lot of this discussion tonight, I, th I think I'm feeling, you know, we're not going to solve this in 90 minutes. But there's a lot of collaboration. A lot of people are saying the same things. And for yourself in, in your position, that's hopeful, don't you think? No, it is. This has been quite a privilege and learning experience because as a state park manager, we're just the part of the quilt of, of the attraction. But a theme that is resonating with me, and I think John DeFries completely understands it. There's been many elements, but it's all about branding. You know, we talked about HTA losing their funding or having it reduced. And we don't need to do marketing. I think we need to rebrand for the visitor what the expectations are. You mentioned something that really resonated, Kuleana versus Aloha. I think we've, to be kind of crass, we've pimped out a Hawaiian culture because it's attractive, but I don't think we've actually dove into the core of the fundamental real values of Hawaiian culture. But at, at state parks, in terms of rebranding, we're trying to teach the visitor that there's limits. We did it at Haena. It took us 20 years working with the community to come up with a master plan, and we were blessed in some way by a flood that waived procurement. We could repurpose dollars, and in record time, we rebuilt Haena, and we took a 2,000-a-day feature, and we brought it down to 100 lots at the request of the community. Those 100 lots now empower the shuttle because when those lot those spaces are full they have to use the shuttle and then as, as mayor victorino mentioned we're doing it at wainapanapa we set up a reservation system there we're turning away visitors because they don't have reservations now the problem with that is that we're not reducing tourism we're redistributing it mm -hmm. so at state parks we're just one of the the pieces but I think if we looked at it holistically and we start looking at limits and then through HTA and marketing and, and even the quality of the hotel, bring, bring back the quality, we rebrand the image that we expect kuleana and reciprocity and it's no longer Ikoma Mai unlimited. It's like, yeah, you may be able to get on an airplane and find a hotel, but the place you want to go to now has limits and they may retune their vacation plans going, you know what? It's full up this year. Let, like Kalalao is a great example. We, we do 60 permits a day. And when it's full, there's people in Germany and wherever that just want to come and hike Kalalao, but they'll delay until they can get a permit. And I think we need to look at the state holistically, and it's complicated, but we start looking at where we put in those limits, get the word out, rebrand ourselves as we're higher quality and higher price, but better quality for the less people makes a lot of sense and it yeah. brings back Kuleana responsibility back into the visitor yes uh, in, in the same time it gives the local people some value that they're being respected and their voices are being heard Mahina uh, your thoughts on tonight's conversation because I, I'm feeling very positive again I'm not naive we're not going to solve this tonight but uh, there's been a lot of interesting ideas shared some success stories already made you know this, this is an opportunity even in the midst of COVID. Yeah, agreed. You know, with the current economic disruption, 
Um, I like the kind of repivoting uh, or reframing. So instead of seeing tourism as, as a sink, right, a quality of life kind of sink, um, it should be a quality of life driver. So how do we do that, right? How do we do that? How do we collectively come together and, and, and create place space solutions? Because I think we should also be very aware, cautious, we should cautious, caution ourselves around like uh, a one size fit all blanket solution. Uh, because one thing that we've learned in, in this time community can come together in partnership with government, in partnership with, with industry. It, it's, we know this, we have many examples now through COVID. So we just need to come together and tackle the right interventions, the key interventions and, and do it collectively. And we know this, you know, um, we know all the folks that I've talked to, they want this, they want, we know that tourism is not gonna go away, but we need to better manage tourism and and what folks are saying is that they there is locals want to be a part of the of collaborative solution making so they want to be at the table to help set limits uh help support our council members and our state legislators uh to regulate and to make sure that there's reciprocity um, and, and to ensure that there are jobs for our kids and so that we can stave off the out migration of kama'aina you know the, I it's like the pie in the sky. I think I, I, I also, I, in some ways, in my capacity at the food bank, hunger was something that everybody wanted to address, right? Especially during COVID. But we needed somebody to take the lead, somebody who would own it and bring everybody together to talk about, break the silos and just talk about how we can make ourselves more resilient. I think we have an opportunity here with the visitor industry and, and someone needs to own that, but who can own it? Someone who actually needs to be at the, needs to know who to invite to the, to the discussion. Somebody who gets paid to do this. I mean, it's been done in Iceland, it's been done in other communities where somebody is the czar, if you will, of the visitor industry. Eric, you have some thoughts? I do. I, look, I, I don't want to come off overly economic. I, I grew up here. I, I agree with everything that's been said about the quality and the, the culture and all that stuff. We still have to address the question of jobs. Yeah. Who's going to get, who's going to have the ability to make a living. And I think there's a, you know, I'd like to say something positive uh, in the line of what uh, uh, John was saying. Tourism can be an incubator. And one obvious place to do that is in agriculture. We're importing 90 plus percent of our food. And that means that there could be hundreds of people uh, producing that food locally and selling it locally. The problem is it's a terrible job. To be farmer, it's really hard. They don't have the support. They don't have the marketing support. The fact is you, you, work, you work hard and you make little. What farmers need to do is we need to make sure that farmers can organize and we need to help them market their goods without being screwed by the brokers. I'd like to say something good about tourism in this sense, my tourist boss. I mean, Blackstone bought Turtle Bay and the opportunity is there partly because Kathleen and I and others in the community fought hard to prevent over tourism in that community. So, but they bought it and they're running 11 farms across the street from the hotel. Those farms are being, are producing for the hotel and producing for the community. They're putting in a, a, a wash and pack plant so those farmers can actually pack their stuff and get it to sell. It's possible to, to use tourism as an incubator. It's possible to make farming a good job here in Hawaii. It's possible to make, to make it uh, so that we can uh, feed our own people with our own efforts. That can be done, it can be done now. We don't need high tech, we need leadership and organization of farmers and a way for them to market uh, in a way they can make money. I, I couldn't agree with you, Mark. I couldn't agree to with that. you. To that, yeah. other diversification. This shirt is made by one of Honolulu's youngest top designers. I don't want to say his name because I didn't ask him. But when our owners in Tahiti we know uh, saw what he was doing, yeah. they asked me to bring him down a month ago. He's gonna design two hotels for them on Mo'orea. And when I say design, he's going to do all the interiors. He's going to do all the design for them. Um, and he's going to probably have to hire 10, 15 people to pull that off. What an exciting, fun thing for a young Hawaiian uh, to go and do an experiment. So there are many of these, as Eric is saying, but some of these things need to start with saying, well, you know, we don't want tourism. No, we want to correctly manage it. We have to have input. We have to have everybody have a seat at the table. Well, government has a seat at the table. You know, you talk about respect of parks. You drive down King Street. Look what the homeless have done to those parks on King Street. And you try to tell a tourist, Malama, and, and they, yeah. yeah, look at that. 
So it, it is a big issue for everybody to get on. But if we can work together and have dialogue, you're going to come out with better ideas and processes of moving forward. Sometimes more or sometimes less is more, sometimes more is less. You don't want to have so many voices at the table where this is unproductive. I've been through so many forums where it's like, okay, after today, tonight, we're going to all hug each other. Well, we won't hug because we're in COVID, but we're going to hug each other and we'll be on our way. I, I, that's not the, the intent of this. Again, not to solve the industry issue, but to have some real collaboration and, and understanding and maybe some action items at the end of the day. Peter, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to you because it, it, I, st I still believe that Hawaiian Airlines has an impact. Uh, in all of this discussion, even in, in diversification, whether it be ag, whether it be, uh, or, you know, the fashion, the retail industry, Hawaiian Airlines is very much a part of this community. You live here, you work here, you are the, I, I, the state's airlines, if you will. How do you move forward to be a part of that solution, yet still have that balance knowing that without bringing visitors we, that we need, whether they're new visitors or old visitors or Canadian or, or from, from Asia, how do you be a part of the solution and still be productive community contributors? Well, look, I think uh, diversification is a really important discussion. I think Carl's points earlier about needing to think about where we have the competitive advantages and where we can be successful is, is part of how we have to define it. Uh, I'm very proud of the role we play locally because unlike the um, the other airlines we compete with, we have all of the jobs here. Uh, we have the, the uh, airport workers like all the other uh, airlines have, uh, but we have the flight attendants and the pilots, the mechanics, uh, the management people, uh, the technology people. And those are, those are good jobs in our community. And I, I think if we can um, grow uh, places like that, it, it can be very helpful uh, part of this equation. Uh, I, I think it's important to us to, you know, we think about serving Hawaii uh, a little differently, I think, than our competitors, and we, and we take uh, a lot of pride in that as well. Uh, we try and, um, you know, when we carry that name on the side of our airplane, we want to carry that um, spirit um, with us as well and, and respect it. Uh, and so I think there is an opportunity for us to be a part of the conversation and grow it and diversify, but diversify doesn't mean getting away from tourism and replacing it with something else. Uh, I don't think they were trying to do that when they were trying to diversify from ag generations ago, they were trying to add something else. And, and I think adding something else is, is great, but let's make sure we manage this thing that is the engine of our economy and the job creator in our economy well, so it serves us and serves our community, and serves our, uh, our needs. Thank you, Peter. I, we're getting close to wrapping up. I wanna turn back to Cindy, uh, because Cindy, I think we've, we've heard a lot of positive things uh, as far as diversification and strategies. At the end of the day, I don't wanna forget about our communities and, and, the, and the voices that need to be heard. What are you getting out of tonight? I think we're uh, out of tonight. I think there are some wonderful uh, discussions on how we can move forward. I think what we need to really be looking at is programs and projects that realistically we can implement right now that can help support our visitors, our economy, our community, and our businesses. Uh, it's it's for uh, for an area like Kahalu Beach Park, we see hundreds of, of visitors every day. And what we need to do, and I am so grateful for our volunteers, is every day they're there educating the visitors with Aloha on how to take care of place. And I think when we look at how we can manage and we talk about this balancing how do we balance this biodiversity with this economic recovery what are we what what should we be doing i think the marketing is really important and what that person sitting next to wendy said is really looking at the visitor and their and and really focusing in 
on visitors that will really look at Kuleana and, and uh, support our um, resources when they are here. But education is a very, very important part of uh, this, creating this type of Kuleana. Thank you, Cindy. I, I want to, Joel, I want to hear your thoughts. We're going to wrap up very slow yeah, soon. I think it's, it's really interesting yeah. tonight's conversation because you have, you know, the, the visitor industry got cracks from COVID, right? So there was this, so, so you can hear kind of the visitor industry is kind of going like, hey, let's, let's be careful, like protect this. This is important to us. As much as we understand there's over visitors, we're still very cautious of that. And then you hear people in the community saying, oh, the, the beach parks are out of control. Our special places are getting trampled. Right. So there's kind of I feel like there's kind of two different camps of like, how do we protect these very, very special places that have been so important to us as we grew up in these areas? And, and, and then also, how do you create jobs and how do you make sure you continue to have a healthy visitor industry? It's just kind of it's interesting to hear the two different I, I mean, maybe there's more perspectives, but it kind of sounds like how do we care for these places? And, and if I'm in that camp, I'm saying the community has to be involved. Because Absolutely. When you look. Go ahead, you look at no, Joe, I want to, because I want to, we're going to wrap up in about a minute and a half. I want to go to Napua for just a quick Napua, just your final thoughts before, if you could wrap it up very quickly, but I want to go to Hawaii Island as well. Napua. Um, I just wanted to note that um, the videos and the brochures, information coming to our visitors are all very important pieces, but there has to be a last line of defense. There has to be community members paid to be in the field to be able to render the information that are going to save visitor lives. So visitor information personnel um, is what we need and the community needs to be the stewards to serve in that role. Um, if you don't have the community serving in that role, you don't have the place specific intelligence to be able to get the job done. The credibility as well. Uh, uh, Wendy, I wanna hear your thoughts. Yeah, so we've talked about vision and strategy and we've also talked about plans and implementation. And I just really want everyone to know that all that's happening right now because of John's leadership and his team with Hawaii Tourism Authority, it's happening right now. The destination management action plans have been completed and they are being implemented. So those things like hotspots, addressing hotspots, um, hiring community stewards, we have that happening right now on Hawaii Island in Pololu Valley. So I think we need to understand that there is some significant progress going on. I, I couldn't agree more. I can feel it. You, know, you got maybe about 30 seconds and I want to wrap this up, but I want to hear your final thoughts. Sure. Um, you know, Aina Aloha Economic Features is around a central idea that Aina is Ohana, right? And so we're talking about tourism um, with, with systems in mind, with strategy in mind and vision. But here's the thing. We as Kama Aina, as natives of this land, we have to remember that Aina is part of our Ohana and we have to pray, place Aina as the central, the central relationship that we have to cherish and protect. And that is the core of our, our tourism industry. That's our responsibility. That's Kuleana. This has been a wonderful conversation, folks, and I really appreciate everybody's input. I, I try to get to everybody as best as we can because there's so much great minds in this group and, and as well as joining us on Zoom. But I want to thank all of you. We know we will not resolve everything tonight in 90 minute conversation, but it is a very important to bring all sides together, all these voices together. And we hope the ideas shared tonight can turn into action. On behalf of PBS Hawaii's Board of Directors and our dedicated staff, we want to thank all of our guests joining us in studio tonight, as well as those on the internet and Zoom. And most of all, we want to thank for the viewers at home, all the viewers who have phoned in these questions. We have hundreds of questions. It is a privilege to be your public television station. It is a responsibility we acknowledge and we embrace, and a mission we remain steadfast in our commitment to serve. I'm Ron Mizutani. Until next time, aloha.